there, welcome. Welcome to Home Keepers. Hey, why don't you grab a cup of tea and just stay with us for a little while? It's so good to be here and I'm so glad you're there. And I'm believing we have a lot of new viewers today. And welcome, welcome. Don't let this be your last time to visit us. And of course, every day I like to welcome those regular folks. We hear from regularly and we know you're there and praying for us and supporting us and love you very, very much. Got a good program for you today. I love uh, interviewing authors, you know, because you really know where you're going with an interview and what you're going to talk about. And today is no exception. I have a gentleman here by the name of Brad Jersak who has written a very thought-provoking book, A More Christ-Like God. Doesn't that kind of grab your attention? And this deals with some of our perceptions uh, the differences between God and Jesus Christ is uh, things maybe you've thought of and you've never voiced and never gone very deeply into that thought, but uh, Bradley did. He's written a lot of books and we'll be talking to him. He's uh, from Canada actually and it's a delight to meet him just a little while ago and we're going to talk about this book. And we are going to fix, Stephanie and I, a burrito bake. You know, I was out of town last week. I went to this big convention. Uh, the Assemblies of God, uh, they meet every two years. And I, I don't know, around 30,000 30, people there. And so I'm running around with my friends. And you know, sometimes a person will come and say, I watch your show, but you know, this time they all want to talk about Stephanie, that, that, that girl who cooks with you. So uh, her fame, I think we're going to have to get security for her actually, but I'm going to join her. We're going to make a burrito bake. And if you are as hungry as I am at this moment. I can hardly wait to taste it. But before I join her, I again want to offer you a book. While these last, we have a very limited supply, Beauty from the Inside Out. And I'd say 99% of the women who are watching this uh, are kind of interested in this kind of thing. Uh, tells you how to be beautiful inside according to the scripture, but also outside. I am uh, reading, I read through the Bible all the time, and today I'm in the book of Esther. Before I came to the office, I was reading that, and boy, that girl spent a lot of time fixing herself up, you know, with cosmetics and all this stuff. So it's always been, ladies, don't feel guilty about it. And this book is yours. This is an amazing price for $12, and um, that includes the shipping and handling. Think of that. Might be the biggest bargain you'll know about this week. And you can, uh, if you want to write to us, that address is on your screen. It's our box, 6922 Clearwater, Florida, 33758. Or if you call, uh, the uh, number of our answering service is 1-800-229-0059. And like I said, we'll get them out to you as long as they last. Uh, and I'm over here with Stephanie, and I mean, it is aromatherapy <laughs> in here today. Yes. Uh, you've heard of aromatherapy and all that, right? Sure. Um, does that, is that ever food aroma or is it just the lavenders? And no, I only thought it was the lavender and stuff, but I'm sure food could the, be. Yeah. I, I want you to talk just a second about Pinterest. We're on there. We are on there. Our and recipes, I'm your shows. ignorant about it. No, so if you go to, if you just go to Pinterest and, um, it, there's a search site, you can look up Homekeeper's recipes and it'll pull up the page and it, you can also pull up all the Homekeeper's shows. Mm -hmm. So right on Pinterest, Pinterest.com. God bless Susan, mm -hmm. who's behind the camera, but mm -hmm. she puts all that stuff on for us. Yep. Yep. Okay, what are you doing here? Okay, so you're going to spray the pan, because all you wanted to do today was look pretty, so you're just spraying the pan yeah. and looking pretty. Now, see, this is what happens around here. Uh, no one sprays a pan. Like I, I'm going to tell a secret. Oh, I okay. tell Arthleen Rippy, we've done too many taco bakes, so let's not do taco bakes <laughs> for a while. So we're doing one. So we're doing a burrito bake instead. <laughs> I'm telling you that the viewers <laughs> like them. They really do. I'm going to take one out and take this out because it's hot. No kidding. Uh, you know, in that convention, people would say, they didn't all know your name, but they like the girl that cooks with me. Well, that's nice. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I have a pound of hamburger in here and some onions. Let's talk about the burrito bake, shall we? Mm -hmm. And then I put in a packet of taco seasoning. Mm -hmm. Which and I'm going to put as in an aroma. a can of my very favorite things, refried beans. And then you sprayed an, a 13 by 9 pan. Mm -hmm. And you have um, crescent rolls, a can of crescent mm -hmm. rolls. And you're going to stir this. Okay. I love to do that. Okay. You scare me. I will do that. 
while I do this. <laughs> I'm just gonna unroll the crescent rolls. Now Stephanie has really encouraged our gals and given them good ideas for um, being organized mm -hmm. in your house mm -hmm. and her shopping and her coupons and all that stuff. Yes, I'm working on some organization this weekend actually. And this is one <clears throat> you could make the night before, put in the fridge. And, oh yes. Um, make a double batch of this and then just freeze one of them and you mm -hmm. have dinner another night. Yeah, I, I, I think, love having freezer meals. I think I told you once about that gal I had on who she had a ministry or something but called herself a home manager and that mm -hmm. really stuck with me. That's kind of what you do. Yes, you, true. And when you when you add that to it, it gives it kind of an importance. I sure, because some people say, oh, I'm, I'm just a housewife. Yeah. Or I'm, you know, I'm Don't just, ever say that again. I'm just a mom. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Ay, ay, ay. There's nothing, nothing Not more just important. a mom. In fact, I think if the United States can ever turn around, they're going <clears> to <throat> have to get the home right. Yes, for sure. Okay, how's that? You're doing good. Just Well, you can continue stirring that. All I'm doing is I'm... I'm squeezing the perforations together mm -hmm. and I'm just forming this down on the bottom of the pan and up the sides a little bit. That's all I'm doing. Make sure all the perforations are together. And it is smelling good. Yeah. Um, so I'll turn this over to you and I will put topping on this one we just got okay, out of the cool. oven. You have um, lettuce, and lettuce, tomatoes, and only put olives on half because Matthew doesn't like olives, so we're being nice to Matthew. We do today. anything to make our crew happy. Yes. Anything. Well, almost anything. Well, I'm still cooking with meat. They're a bunch of good folks. Okay, so I have this um, all in the bottom, and I'm just going to take the hamburger, onion, taco seasoning, refried bean mixture. Would your family like this? That was loud. I'm sorry? Would your family like this? Oh, yes. We love Mexican food. Mm -hmm. And this is so easy. Yeah. And so, so economical. All just on half because of our temperamental yes. members yes. of the crew. Yes. We baby them. Well, you know, we have to spoil them if we want good Isn't that pretty? Because I, I am a bit addicted. Excuse me while I get up. You know what we really need is sour cream. That would have been a good I, I'm addi addicted to pretty food. I yeah. like because you eat with your eyes mm -hmm. before you eat with your mouth. Yep. Okay, so I have um, mozzarella and sharp cheddar cheese. This calls for two cups of each. You can yeah. easily just use one because this is a lot is of it, cheese. Is that what yes, you do? Probably because this is especially to save money. Mm -hmm. You could get and then you could get two two mm -hmm. burrito bakes out of two bags. Make two and then freeze. It, it cuts rather nicely because. Remember, this just came out of the oven. So that really, really smells good. If it's, if it's set a little while longer, it might So cut. then you just bake this for about 30 minutes, and then you put the topping on. Sour cream would really, really, really... Yeah, good. it would. Really be good. Here. Thank you. Oh, and I get a little of the biscuit. This, this is definitely a meal. Mm-hmm. Even though it's got the lettuce and all, I'd mm. probably... Is it good? Yeah. It's hot. It's hot. Mm, it is good. Let it cool for a minute. Guess what? Jeepers. It tastes like a burrito. It does. That's why it's called a burrito bake. <laughs> there, maybe so. <laughs> think. Okay, I, I'm sure a lot of you want this. Yes, it's very recipe, good. Recipe, and you can get it on Pinterest, right? Right, or you can email, or on my, my fan page. You can go to my fan uh -huh. page on Facebook. On Facebook, or mm -hmm. um, email us, or write to us. No cost. We'll get it right to you. Mm. And... That in, is that good? Yeah. Uh, that information is coming up on your screen, so uh, make note of that and stick around. I want you to meet my guest, Brad Jersek. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, just write to the address on your screen, or you can email your request to artheline at rippy.org. It's a privilege to welcome to the show author Brad Jersek. He is uh, from British Columbia, Canada, 
author of several books, Can You Hear Me? and God Who Speaks, on the faculty of Westminster Theological Center, and um, editor for Plain Truth Ministries. That's right, yes. What do you do in your spare time? <laughs> I, I don't recall having spare time, but now I, I do get to work from home a lot, so that's really nice, where uh, whether I'm doing course prep or or editing, I can be at my kitchen table and mm -hmm. smell the kind of food that you're baking today. Oh, good. Now, uh, you teach in London as well. Is yeah, this... Cheltenham in, in the UK, that's right. Do and you fly back and forth or? Yeah, we do intensives a couple times a year where I, where I do a lot of teaching face to face. Mm -hmm. And then when I come home, we also do some over the internet. And so it's a marvelous mix. We live in exciting days, do we not? Now, it also says you're a reader for the All Saints of North American Monastery. What is that? Well, I have these buddies that are East Orthodox monks who live in a monastery, and on Sunday mornings, they have about 60 folks show up for services. And so, while on the one hand, I'm in what we call a low church tradition, very informal at Fresh Wind Christian Fellowship, I also serve as a reader there. So at least once or twice a month, you'll see me in a robe chanting scriptures and psalms and so on. And that's what a reader does. A reader reads? Yep. All right. <laughs> it's my joy to educate my wonderful viewers out here. <clears throat> now, this book really, uh, really grabbed my attention. And um, it's something that's very thoughtful and thought-provoking, I think. And that is a more Christ-like God. That kind of grabs you right there. And as I got into a little bit, I realized that a lot of these thoughts were in the back of my mind, and I never brought them forward. And that basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the difference between Jesus Christ and God, the Father. Right, and really there shouldn't be one, right? Theologically, we would say that, that Jesus uh, is of one essence with his Father. So he could say, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. Or Paul could say, all the fullness of God dwelled in Jesus. Or the book of Hebrews. Hebrews. Jesus <laughs> is the exact, the exact representation and likeness. When it says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, it's sort of like God is the sun and Jesus is the shine from the sun and you can't have one without the other. And yet, even in the church, even for Christians, sometimes we almost play good cop, bad cop, where, you know, God is the... The, the stern dad and Jesus is sort of saving us from God. And that's <laughs> actually not Christianity. And it, it creeps into the back of our thinking, that's but then affects our, our lives, I think. Uh, what was it that, that caused this for you to think about it enough to write a book and obviously a lot of research? Yeah, I, I felt like um, I was having a lot of secret meetings, like Nicodemus meetings, with two types of people. Uh, one type of people were Christians who are actually saying, I'm thinking about leaving the faith because I can no longer believe in a God who, and then they would give me a list that was quite unchristlike. That was the God of the Old Testament, right? Well, and, or... Um, they didn't or get upset with the, Jesus, did they? No, no, they quite like him, you know. Um, but it was, or I would even say a God of their own imagination or a projection. The other type of people were those who were ready to follow Jesus, but there was some deal killers around their idea of God. And so I, I, I just needed to say, look at it. God is Christ-like, and in him is no unchristlikeness at all. That, that says it. Okay, now what do we do with the God of the wrath, anger, and all these things, and, we, and, and the things that, that he caused? Right. Well, I would say, first of all, Let's, uh, let's not assume that's the only God we see in the Old Testament. So, for example, I see a very Christ-like God in Psalm 103. Yeah, the Lord yeah. is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. And you get this kind of uh, picture of God that's pointing ahead to Jesus. Um, and then you've got these other images of God. And what I don't want to do is just sort of uh, pick and choose the ones I like. But what we are called to do is when we're, whenever we read any part of the Bible, we're not to read it without Jesus. We go there with him as our rabbi, with him as our lens, so that when we're reading about God, that must pass through the filter of, of who Jesus revealed God to be. And every other claim to revelation needs to bow before the living God when he came in the flesh, in the person of Jesus. And so while there were immature understandings, while there were perceptions of God, even in the Bible, 
Uh, these are cleansed as we look at it through the lens of Jesus. Uh, there was one thing you said in there that he doesn't condemn us. We condemn ourselves. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was a real eye-opener to me. Uh, we choose. Mm -hmm. uh, we choose the outcome, basically. That's true. And so Paul is trying to explain this in Romans when he says, look, at it's the wages, payment of, of sin. It's the wages of sin is death and condemnation. But the free gift, the grace of God, uh -huh. it, it, it comes through Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so um, we then see wrath is sort of a picture of what sin does to us. And we see the cross as what Jesus does for us. This is, this is eye-opening, I'm telling you. Uh, my, <clears throat> years ago, my, my daughter, she was 15 years old in high school. And my husband died tragically and suddenly. And I, I went to the school to get her and to tell her. And I asked the principal if, if I could have some moments with her in his office. I told her what happened. You know, the first thing she said, why did God let this happen? Oh. Um, I think that's the most natural thing in the world. We don't say we blame God, maybe, but we question why in the world, uh, you know, could you allow that to happen? I think that's a real perception. Yeah, that's true. And in fact, in the ancient world, they thought God not only allowed, but caused everything. And Jesus comes along and says, you know, um, it's not quite like that. You know, the world is... The, the world's a dangerous place, but I, I, I'm going to come and participate in your human condition. And so God takes on human flesh to experience all that we've experienced and to show us that supernatural love is the way through it. Well, <clears throat> Dr. Phil, you see Dr. Phil mm -hmm. in Canada? Yeah, yeah. He says over and over, perception is reality. Mm. Uh, do you agree? Yeah. Yeah, to the person anyway. Yeah. And so... Do you think more or less maybe the church from the time the, the Old New Testament were completed um, or is this just a Western thing that that has been our perception of God? We've got Jesus over here and we've got God over here. And yet, like you said, that first chapter of Hebrews says that Jesus is the exact representation. Yeah, I think throughout Christian history, there's been sort of a clear stream or multiple streams that understand this, but we tend to slip over and over again back into that old thinking where it's like, if something bad happens to me, God must have done it, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, <clears throat> Jesus didn't do it, no, but God did. And, and in fact, uh, God comes in human flesh as Jesus Christ to show us that that's not as hard as all. He, he just loves us. And even the cross then is a picture. It's a picture of God's self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love. And I just think that that's the image of God we need to hold in our hearts, not something more like Zeus or, you know, throwing lightning bolts at the earth or drowning us in tsunamis. Oh, no, uh, God shows us exactly what he's like, especially on the cross. Yeah, and when you uh, read the Psalms, how David just so beautifully expressed God. That was the only God he knew. Yeah, yeah. All right. You say that people instinctively push their highest expectations and their deepest disappointments onto God. Poor God, you know. Yeah. Um, Unchrist-like images or a doting grandfather, mm -hmm. uh, a deadbeat dad. Yep. Uh, that's kind of self-explanatory, but what did you mean by that? Well, I was thinking about uh, people who've, ex let's say if you're from a broken home and, and your dad has left. Um, it's natural for us to laminate that image of a father onto God as father and the God who wasn't there when I needed him. And that's a, a little lesson to any fathers watching that they are, to those little ones, they are the representation. The kids can't help it. Right? Uh -huh. So it's imp And, you know, no dad's going to be perfect. No. I'm, sh I'm sure not. And so my kids would have unchristlike images of God because of mistakes I've made, but we do... We do our best to be conscious of that and to show them to the Father. Yeah, and um, I'm so thankful. I've got a son and a son-in-law uh, that I have five grandchildren. They can, they can look to those men and see, some, see a pretty good representation. Um, and what is more important? Okay, you talk about an orphan spirit. Yeah, and so... Uh, sometimes in our hearts, if we feel that dis disconnect from a mom or a dad, if we feel orphaned, in, even emotionally, they may still be around, but not emotionally right. present to us. 
that too gets uh, laminated on God and an orphan spirit needs to be addressed with a, a spirit of adoption and so that we, we understand that we're beloved children in God's family and actually experience that love in our hearts. Um, also, uh, some Christians, and I think especially in the Western world, I, I'm not sure you would see this so much in uh, Haiti or Honduras or places like that, but uh, it's Santa Claus God, yes. that he's supposed to give us everything we want. We make a list and check it twice. And yeah, the Santa Claus God, you, you can understand how a, a child could confuse them because we're celebrating the birth of Jesus at the same time we're having, you know, this celebration around Santa. Mm -hmm. And Santa is tricky because on the one hand, he can be like the doting grandfather. You go to the mall, you sit on his knee, you get a snapshot mm -hmm. and you you tell him everything you want and you expect it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we've got this song, you know, um, that you, he knows who's being naughty or nice <laughs> and he's he's keeping a list of, of what? Of your sins, you know, and we start thinking of God a that God way. the Old Testament. Right, so legalistic on one side, doting grandpa on the other, and then you come to the Christmas tree and your pony's not there. Yeah. So now he's also absent. And he, Can't do it right. Right. Hey, if you just tuned in, I'm talking to uh, Brad Jursak. We've had the um, website up for a while. I suppose you can get this C Canadian Amazon and all those places. Yeah, it's yeah. on Amazon. Uh, pastors, Sunday school teachers, you want this book. A More Christ-like God. You would have to admit that the title is catchy. And uh, we're just barely scanning the surface of it. But uh, you might want to take down that information. It's on the screen right now. Um, my image of God as my obedient servant, ex experience training, not public punishment and affliction, passivity, and fatalism. That's all wrapped up in some people's perception, right? Yeah, these can be, we'll have complicated, very complex packages of what God is like. Probably uh, when you think of cooking, you know, we've, we make a recipe and we bring together this idea. And I think, I think it's always good to be uh, running our recipe of our ideas of God back through Jesus again. And so I've learned that it's really important to saturate ourselves in the Gospels uh, to see uh, not only that, that, that God is not this harsh, punitive, punitive judge, he's a loving savior that's come in the person of Jesus, but also that he's not just a projection of my own wish dreams, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes even my image of Jesus is distorted. I think of him as like a nicer version of myself or something. <laughs> it's like, no, we, we come to the, the Gospels and, and he wants to cleanse our palate. And also, um, when we disobey, mm -hmm. we set that up. God didn't. No, that's uh, right. Whatever, uh, whatever comes from our, our disobedience. And the, I keep getting back to this, um, I don't know, like a light bulb went on in my head when I read mm. your book, mm. that God and Jesus are the same. Yeah, that Jesus is a, he's a perfect reflection of what, of, of, of the, the invisible God. So, so we're like, what is God like anyway? Mm -hmm. And so I, I like to say this, I, I've been uh, actually doing postdoctoral studies so I can explain it to a child, that when, that God is love, and if you want to see what that love, love looks like in the world, you look at Jesus. Jesus yeah. Um, now, he, is, he does judge, and Jesus will judge, and all those things. And, and Jesus picked up the whip, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I still see your point of the difference. Right. And in fact, we need to be careful then how we define judgment. We've often thought of judgment as just destruction and condemnation. Mm -hmm. But Jesus comes along and says, oh, I didn't come to condemn the world. It's already gone to hell in a handbasket. Um, his judgments are restorative. His judgments are mercy. His judgments are, are like uh, Hebrews tells us, it's the, it's the judgment of a loving father. So it's not about harming, it's about restoration. And any condemnation, we've put that on ourselves. Yeah, that's exactly we right. We chose that. that it, it's, he gives us that choice. I tell people, yeah. you know, when you were born, you popped out of your mom's womb. He was, God was standing there and gave you a free will. Yeah. Just handed it to you. Yeah, I think we, we really need to believe this, that it's sort of like God is there before us as this loving Father. When we turn from Him, we cast a shadow. 
What happens in that shadow is condemnation. Repentance is not God punishing us for what happens, or judgment is not punishing. Rather, it's a call to turn back towards him again so that we can experience mm -hmm. the light of his, of his mercy. Um, before we run out of time, competing values in Western culture, freedom or love, what, what were you talking about there? Yeah, what I've seen is there's, in our culture, um, what's your highest value? Is, is your highest value freedom defined as doing what I want, how I want, where right. I want, with whom I want, um, or is freedom, or, or is our highest value love, which is about self-giving, it's about caring, it's about compassion and mercy mm -hmm. and empathy, right? Mm -hmm. And at, at some point, uh, these can come into conflict because freedom's wonderful and love is wonderful, but which one gets the last word? And I think that, that conflict has actually come out of two images of God, one where God is the one who does whatever he wants, to whomever he wants, however he wants, and the other is the God who is first of all, love, and who's shown us that love on the cross. Yeah, and even the Ten Commandments for our good. Absolutely. Every one of them. I would love to live in a, in a country or region where I know for sure no one will ever murder me, steal from me, steal my wife from me. Lie uh, to me. Lie to me. Wouldn't that be great? Well, be... we didn't want that, apparently. <laughs> right. Uh, we're almost out of time, but you... Um... You really make it concise. You see, blaming God means that God did something wrong. Mm. That, Brad, that's powerful. Yeah. And uh, when, as Christians and believers, uh, I, I'm glad you put a light on that. Yeah, I just really believe that uh, God is the perfection of all we call goodness. He's good and all that he does is goodness. Mm -hmm. Any distortion to that, that's come from our side. Oh, that is so good. I appreciate you coming by. I, I know you've enjoyed what he had to say. And remember, you can get the book uh, through Amazon, probably Barnes & Noble, any of those uh, books, the name of it, A More Christ-Like God. And <clears throat> I hope you, that you'll remember to join us next time. Uh, God has been so good to send us greatest get, uh, guests. And I think you, uh, if it's your first time to, today to watch the program, you realize that uh, we've had a very superior guest today. Uh, but we are out of time now, but I hope you'll join me next time. And please, friend, remember, there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers. 